Hi, everyone. This is the Tokenomics Design Playlist, and we're looking at the nine biggest mistakes that builders make when it comes to their tokenomics as part of our design series. As a disclaimer, this content is for educational purposes only, it is not legal, financial, technical, or investment advice. So we're here in this nine mistakes to avoid before we go through the seven step process, step by step of how to design your tokens. We've already covered in the previous video, three best practices to keep in mind as we go through the, the entire process. And the nine biggest mistakes to avoid and keep in mind while we're going through this process are not knowing why you need a token, not planning ahead for a token, not knowing what type of token you're issuing, relying on price always increasing, underestimating collateral risks, assuming your product usage means token success, only focusing on token supply instead of aspects of token demand and utility, not modeling and stress testing enough, and ignoring regulatory risks. I see these nine mistakes all the time, and hopefully by talking about them today, it helps you avoid making the same mistake. First biggest mistake is not knowing why you need a token. The same way you don't start a company you know, just to be a founder, just to be an entrepreneur, you don't launch a token just to have a token. There's a real cost and downside to launching a token that many builders don't initially think about. In the words of Andre, development takes time much longer than you as a developer think it will, right? Development is already difficult enough as it is. Once you launch a token, then add on to that you know, hundreds, thousands of people shouting on your Telegram, your Discord, Twitter, et cetera, asking you, when will this feature be released? You know, when will the price go up? All these things that are that many of which are not even in your direct control. So you want to make sure that there's a good fundamental reason you need a token. Start by picking a problem to solve, not by picking a token to launch. The second biggest mistake is not planning ahead for a token. It is common to launch a product first and then a token later. And there's nothing fundamentally wrong with doing that. Lots of teams launch a product first and then a token later. But when you do that, you still need to plan ahead for how the token fits into the product. Eventually, when the token is launched, how will it improve the product? How will it benefit holders? And how will it reward project contributors? Those are the three components to win-win-win tokenomics. An example is Uniswap, right? They released their product without planning for the token. And so when they released their token, they did some things that in hindsight might not have made the most sense. They don't capture, for example, any protocol revenue, and therefore the Uni token itself does not earn any revenue or capture or accrue any value from the protocol, whereas other AMMs today, such as Curve, earn and even distribute revenues to their token holders. So you need to plan ahead for your token design, even if you have no plans to launch one immediately or launch one yet, because it's hard to retroactively fit a token onto a product uh, and, and have that token actually improve the product. The third biggest mistake is not knowing what type of token you're issuing. You know, it's easy to claim that your token will be used as a form of payment, a means of exchange or a store of value. But be honest with yourself, people still debate if even Bitcoin and Ethereum are stores of value or means of exchange, right? So is your token really going to immediately beat both Bitcoin and Ethereum? More than likely in the vast majority of cases, utility, payment for a specific benefit, not being a, uh, not being a means of exchange in general, is realistically what your token can and will be used for. Staking is not the utility, right? Price speculation on itself is not utility. The utility for a specific benefit is likely what your token is going to be used for. And so knowing what type of token you're launching and what it's going to be used for uh, will just help you avoid these traps of launching a token that you assume is going to act as a store of value, but it's just fundamentally not going to and actually hurts you, the project, and your token holders. The fourth big mistake is relying on always increasing price, right? Even the fastest products in the world, the fastest growing products in the world 
have periods of slow growth. And if your tokens rely on the price always going up or usage always going up, it's only a matter of time, right? Of when, not if, your protocol will explode. This was, we saw this in Terra. We saw this in Steemit, right? Which is a social media platform where lots and lots of people used it, but as the token price went up, but then once the token price kind of started going down and uh, behavior was, because of behavior being incentivized for just spam over quality behavior, it just collapsed. Same thing for Ohm, same thing even for FTX, which uh, ignoring the aspect of you know, mismanaging client funds, using their own token, their FTT token as collateral, and then needing to defend that price, you know, at that price point of $22, for example, um, and having no resiliency to when the price drops below that, it just it just doesn't work out well, right? So prices, uh, protocols that need the growth in the token price are Ponzi schemes, not businesses, in Jason's word. If your tokens cannot handle volatility and random events, your product will not survive. The, the fifth mistake builders make is underestimating collateral risks. Now, sometimes using collateral is unavoidable, right? MakerDAO needs collateral to back die to mint die. Otherwise, if you could just mint die with no collateral, right, there'd be no fundamental value to die. It wouldn't track. It wouldn't be pegged to $1. But it's easy to underestimate the risks of collateral, especially because they seem smaller in normal market conditions. What I mean by this is that the risks associated with collateral actually get worse exactly when they matter the most. So exactly when collateral matters in a market crash is exactly when things like liquidity gets worse. Liquidity decreases, making things even worse than they first appeared. Correlation increases. So uh, different diversified assets of collateral that in theory are uncorrelated or are uncorrelated in normal market conditions often are, end up much more correlated in market crashes. So you have less diversification benefits than you thought, as well as if you have collateral that is exposed to your own protocol, look at FTX, for example, their collateral is an FTT token. They needed the collateral to stand up and perform at the very moment when their protocol is suffering, but their collateral is a function of their protocol. And so it's highly correlated to the protocol. So if your protocol is performing poorly and needs the collateral to back it, and your collateral is correlated to your protocol, then you can see how that becomes a problem. Also in market crashes, market cap becomes less of a good approximation for collateral value, right? Market cap assumes that if you can sell one token for $100, then you can sell 10,000 tokens also each for $100. Now you and I know that that's not true in realistic marketing editions, you're gonna have slippage, which means that if I sell 10,000 tokens, I'm gonna get a lot less potentially than $100 for each token on average, but market cap assumes that you can do that. And so looking at all these factors that actually get worse in a market crash, it becomes very clear that using collateral is, can be much more risky than builders first think. And you need controls in place that are designed and rigorously tested to help uh, make your protocol resilient. A great example is the Mango Markets exploit it wasn't a hack, right? It was an exploit of the economic vulnerability created because they had collateral risks that were underestimated and did not have sufficient controls in place. The sixth mistake is assuming that product usage translates automatically into token success. Now, it's important not to optimize, you know, above all else for, for token price. Win-win-win tokenomics, though, benefit token holders, right? It benefits the token holders, it rewards contributors, and it improves the product. But devoid of a clear value capture and value accrual mechanism, there is no fundamental reason that more usage of your protocol necessarily translates into you know, sustainable success for your token. We talked about the Uniswap uh, example already, where the Uni token doesn't have actually any mechanism to accrue value to the token itself uh, based on usage of the protocol, other than just speculation. Another example would be high token velocity, right? Where people are just not, uh, just, just changing hands of your token incredibly frequently. For example, if you imagine like a Web3 Uber with a, with a fictional you know, UBR token, if you buy 10 tokens 
with US dollars to pay for a ride and your driver immediately sells those tokens for US dollars, well, no amount of ride usage has any impact on the, 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 the metrics of the token itself, right? The token price, for example. So more usage does not automatically make your token more valuable. Mistake number seven is only focusing on token supply. Chances are, most of the time you hear someone talking about tokenomics, they're talking about things like allocation, emissions, inflation rates, burns, you know, total supply, circulating supply. These are all elements of tokenomics, but they're all aspects of supply. The demand side matters just as much. Use cases, incentive mechanisms, value drivers, right? Do not neglect the whole usage of and demand side of your tokenomics just to focus on supply, right? Nothing, making it as scarce as possible alone cannot help your token. And so supply is only a part of good tokenomics. You need both uh, strong supply and strong use cases instead of mechanism value driver demand aspects. Mistake number eight is not modeling and stress testing enough. It's hard enough to get a high level design right. There's almost zero chance that you just happen to pick the right quantitative parameters plugged into your design without doing some form of modeling. That could be your emission schedule, right? That could be parameters around fees captured. You, there's almost no chance you just happen to pick those right values. Deterministic and stochastic modeling, right, which is uh, randomness involved in modeling, like Monte Carlo uh, simulations, is used for risk analysis to design for conditions that might happen. As a serious builder, you know that the code you've implemented needs to work as designed, right? That's a smart contract audit, best practice. But you also know that the code you've designed needs to work the right way in the first place. That's tokenomics testing, right? And so not modeling, just like not getting a smart contract audit, audit, not modeling is a telltale sign of an amateur team or a scam project that isn't taking this seriously. Auditing your smart contracts is not enough. Stress testing how it's designed to work is just as, if not even more, important. Finally, the last mistake that teams make or builders make is ignoring regulatory risks. You know, I hear this all the time. Well, Binance does B and B buyback, so can we just do a buyback and burn too? You are not CZ. You are not Binance. I mean, unless you're high CZ, high CZ if you are, but probably you are not Binance. Just because some token has not been rated by the IRS or the SEC yet does not mean that you can do the same thing they're doing and that you won't go to jail. And I'm not. This is not hyperbole, right? With the recent arrest of a tornado crash develop a tornado cash developer. These are serious implications here. And so you need to get a legal opinion. As a reminder, this is not legal advice. This video is not legal advice. You need to talk to an expert and get legal opinion. So that's uh, the nine biggest mistakes that builders make when it comes to their tokenomics. As always, you can find more resources at these links. And in the next video, we'll dive into the first step of the tokenomics design process itself.